chapter 22. Thank you so much for coming and being in God's house this morning. And it's good to see the, the church house almost full. I know there are empty spaces, but that's okay. You've got Easter coming up. You invite somebody to fill those spaces, and we'll do our best to fill it up on the resurrection, uh, resurrection service. And uh, you can get more people to come to church Christmas and Easter at any time of the year. So you just be inviting. You, you be calling people and asking them to come and sit with you on Easter Sunday. And I promise you, a lot of people will come to church just because of that, just because it's Easter Sunday. I want to I preach on this thought this morning. Cursing the darkness, never claiming the light. Cursing the darkness, never claiming the light. And stay in your place right there in 2 Samuel. But I want to show you some things in the book of Job with what Job was going through. How many times he used the word darkness through his trial. In Job chapter 3 and verse 5, he mentions darkness uh, for the, uh, verse 4, he mentions the word darkness the first time. In verse 5, he mentions the word darkness. In verse 6, he mentions the word darkness. Chapter 5, verse 14, he mentions the word darkness. Chapter 10, 21, he mentions the word darkness. Chapter 10 and verse 22, he mentions the word darkness three times. Chapter 12 and verse 22, our pastor preached out of this verse uh, when he discovered that he had cancer and he preached a, a message entitled discovering deep things out of darkness and the verse says in in uh, Job 12 and verse 22 he discovereth deep things out of darkness and bringeth out to light the shadow of death verse 15 chapter 15 he mentions the darkness Chapter 15, verse uh, 3 times he mentions the darkness. Chapter 17, twice he mentions the darkness. Chapter 18, chapter 19, chapter 20, chapter 22, chapter 23, chapter 28, chapter 39, chapter uh, 30, chapter 34, chapter 37, chapter 38, Job mentions the word darkness. And with what he is going through, we can understand why Job felt like there was much darkness around him and he called out that darkness and uh, maybe you could say that he was cursing the darkness. Now listen, I'm not talking about cussing the darkness. We don't cuss as Christians. Thank you, Greg. I appreciate that. <laughs> we don't cuss as Christians. The Bible says we're not to have filthy language and we're not to use the slang language of this word. Please say amen right there. We're not to talk that way. Not cussing uh, not cussing the darkness, cursing the darkness. And I want to say as we walk through this world as Christians, we see darkness that has surrounded us. We see darkness that has come into our world and it seems to be creeping in a little more every day. We see darkness like this anti-Semitism that we see in our culture today. And those that hate the Jews. And the truth of the matter is they don't hate the Jews. They hate this book. They hate the God of this book. They hate the Jesus of this book. And if they can destroy the Jews, then they've destroyed your Bible. But they're going to try to do that in Revelation chapter 19. When they do, Jesus is going to come back in the second coming. We will have already been in heaven for seven years because of the rapture that took place. But what I'm saying is there's darkness that is surrounding us. And it seems like that darkness is growing and growing year after year, day after day. The idea or the thought that men would sell children into sexual slavery, not adults, not not women who are making a choosing to go into this life, but to take little boys and little girls, birth them into this world with the idea that I'm going to sell that child, I'm going to make money off that child, and that child for the rest of their years is going to be raped and damaged by those that want to use their bodies for sexual pleasure. That's a darkness that I do not understand. It's getting darker and darker in this world and you and I as Christians, we do go through this world pointing out these things, saying that's not right. That's not godly. That's like set the children of Israel sacrificing their children to the God of Murloc in the Old Testament, giving their children over to things that they're not ready to handle or deal with, or to sit down in a, in a school and, and teach children about sexuality when they're not old enough. That, that, that's a darkness that I don't understand. I just cannot comprehend how somebody's human mind as an adult can be so dark that they think that that's okay. 
or to see those transgender individuals come in and practically do a striptease routine in front of children. I don't understand that. Why would you expose your child to that? Why would you think that that's okay for your child, a young child, to look at, watch, and, and participate in? This darkness of alcohol has always been around. The darkness of drugs has always been around. But it seems like when it comes to the darkness that we're dwelling in now, it has gotten so dark that men's minds and the perversion of their mind and what they can do to one another and the killing and the hostages and all of that stuff, it just seems like we are in. And we as Christians ought to stand up against it and say, that's wrong. That should not take place. That should not take place anywhere in America. That should not take place anywhere on earth. And thank God there are some countries that have stood up against it. If you don't know this, there was pressure put upon the African nations to accept homosexuality into their society. Put on pressure put on them by our then president. I'm not going to tell you who it was. By our then president put pressure on them to accept homosexuality into their society. And their prime ministers and their presidents and their leaders said, don't come over here. <laughs> we don't believe in that. We don't accept that. And we're not going to accept it into our society. But to think that that kind of darkness, not, not just to say, well, that's your choice. If you're going to live that way, that's your choice. We'll just have to tolerate it. But then go to other nations and say, you're going to tolerate it or we're going to sanction your nation. One, one African leader told them, told our president, keep your money, keep your culture, keep your homosexuality. In our nation, it is wrong. We are not going to accept it. We're going to, Christians ought to be saying, that's wrong. That's wrong. That's not what the Bible says. And we do stand against it. We ought to be cursing the darkness we ought to be saying it at our jobs we ought to be telling it to everybody we know our, Christ, our Christian children ought to know why we stand the way that we stand why we stand with Israel why we stand against these sins why we stand against abortion why we stand against homosexuality why we believe that alcohol is endangering the lives of Mer Americans today and drugs and domestic violence and all of that kind of stuff we ought to tell our children why that's wrong and why it goes against this book and as a child of God I can't stand for it or vote for it but instead I stand against it and many times we're very good at cursing the darkness in fact if you listen to our conversations throughout the week we are real good about cursing the darkness we we can not only we can not only curse the darkness but we can get the lost that are around us to curse the darkness with us can't we well we get to talking about politics and the government and taxes and all that kind of stuff not that taxes are, are darkness, but uh, it's pretty close. <laughs> we, can, we can get the lost world to start agreeing with us, can't we? We can get them. They're not even saved, and they'll say, yeah, that's not right. That, that's wrong. We shouldn't do that. They shouldn't say that. They shouldn't be corrupt like that. I just want to tell you this. The world has always had that darkness in it. The, that darkness has always existed. It used to be kept under wraps. You didn't know about it. There were people doing it, and it wasn't public in public view. But I'm telling you, it's gotten so, it's like, it's gotten so bad. It's gotten so dark. And the volume of darkness in this world has gotten so bad that it's oozing out of every crack. It's coming out of every corner. And we ought to stand as Christians and curse the darkness. But many times we talk so much about the darkness that we never do talk about the light. And the light is greater than the darkness. There's no place that you can go to when you enter into darkness. If you walk in with a light, it does not run that darkness off. The light is always greater than the darkness. And in 2 Samuel... Chapter 22, you find a place where David begins to claim the light and understand his situation through the fact that the darkness of what he was going through is now over. Second Samuel chapter 22, David begins to say some things that I think we as Christians ought to pick up on and we ought to start claiming the light as well as curse the darkness. Cursing the darkness is good. You ought to tell people when they're wrong. You ought to tell your children when you feel like they're making a bad decision and going, my children are out of my house. 
But I can still, as their daddy, sit down with them and say, listen, uh, something's not right. I feel in my heart something's wrong. I can't badger them with that. I can't talk about it the whole time they're around me. I can't beat them up over that. What I do is love them and still give them advice and say, something spiritually is going on here. Something spiritually is wrong here. I see some things that I am worried about. And I have a right to do that. And I should do that as a father. I should curse the darkness in their life and say, these things in your life are darkness and you should leave them alone and one day they may take you away down a down a road a path of sin that you don't want to be involved in we should be able to say that to our brothers and our sisters our family our moms our dads our friends we ought to curse the darkness and tell them this is dangerous stay away from it you can't beat them up over it you can't browbeat them with it but you ought to be able to tell them sometime this is wrong you ought to leave this alone this is going to be dangerous but David in chapter 22 of 2 Samuel begins to rejoice in the light. Verse 2, he said, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, the God, the God of my rock. In him will I trust. He's my shield, the horn of my salvation, my high tower, my refuge, my savior. Thou saveth me from violence. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Verse 7. In my distress I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. And he did hear my voice out of his temple. And my cry did enter into his, uh, into his ears. And the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of heaven were moved, shook because of his wrath. And uh, there went up smoke out of his nostrils, and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it, and the bow of the heavens also came down. And the darkness, listen to this, the darkness, the darkness was under his feet. The darkness was under his feet. I know it looks like it's taking over. I know it looks like it's coming from every, every realm. But the darkness that you see and the darkness that I see, the darkness that we curse is still under his feet. He still has all power. He still is supernatural. He still is a miracle working God. David said God takes this darkness and puts it under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly. And he was seen upon the wings of the wind. And he made the darkness pavilions around him. Him, dark waters and thick clouds of skies through the brightness before him were coals of fire kindled the Lord thundered from heaven and the Most High uttered his voice and he sent out arrows and scattered them lightning and discomfited them he sent out lightning and controlled the lightning is what he's saying he sent out lightning and he controlled what the lightning was doing and the challenge of the seas appeared and the foundations of the world were discovered and the rebuking of the Lord and the blast of the breath of his nostrils what is David saying in these verses he he said, I called upon a mighty God. I called upon an all-powerful God. I prayed to a Lord that can take care of these things, that demonstrates his power. And I'm telling you today, you and I have prayed prayers to a God who is powerful and mighty and a light that is strong and a high power, a God who can answer your prayers. And we ought to claim the light and say, God, I know that you can answer my prayer." We can go around cursing the darkness, but how many times do people hear you say, but let me tell you about a prayer he answered for me this week. I know it's bad out there, but let me tell you about something God's doing in my life and a prayer that he's answered for me. Sitting in this auditorium today, you don't know who they are. I don't, know who, I don't know who all of them are. Amy knows who some of them are. But some of you that are sitting here today, I have prayed for you. I have prayed for you to return to church. I have prayed for you to get back in God's will. I didn't badger you with it. I didn't text you all the time. I didn't beat you over the head with it. But now you're sitting in this auditorium because the God that I prayed to is the God that controls the thunder and the lightning. He rode upon the cherubs. He is a mighty God. And when I pray, he puts power in my prayer and he can accomplish what I cannot accomplish when I pray to a God that the Bible says he hears my voice in his ears. <laughs> you got a child that's out of church and out of the will of God, pray. There's more power in that prayer 
and then you tapping them on the forehead every time you see them. Get back in church. Get back in church. You ought to tell them. You ought to tell them, but don't badger them with it. Get back in church. Get back in church. Get back in church. Let me tell you, there's a Holy Spirit that can come to them in the dark hours of their sleep when they wake up in the morning and scream in their ears, you ought to be back in church. I'm telling you, I've seen God do more through my prayer time than any other way in my life. We ought to be claiming the light and telling the world, I'm praying for you. You may not like me. You may not like my Jesus, but I'm praying for you. And the prayers that we pray go before a God that David describes here who is all-powerful and almighty. I ain't rode on a cherub. Have you rode on a cherub? No. The Bible says he's so powerful, he rides on the cherubs. He controls the thunder and the lightnings. Why do you think he cannot move in the life of your, uh, of your grandbaby or that lost co-worker at work? Why do you think God cannot move in our nation anymore? Why do you think God cannot send revival? Don't, don't just curse the darkness. Claim with it the light that there's a God that wants revival, that wants to send a move upon Christians, that wants to see Christians get right with God and souls be saved. And I am praying to this almighty God. Hallelujah. Amen. Cursing the darkness, claiming the light. The darkness enters in to your loved one's life. Boy, I'm telling you, you can claim the light. In your private time, you can say, Lord, you're my shield. You're my refuge. You're my high tower. You're my buckler. And I ask that you would go. I don't demand anything of God. He is not my puppet. I don't tell God what to do. But I ask of you to enter into their life and run that darkness out of their life. If it is a person they don't need to be around, if it's an individual that needs to get out of their life, I've watched God remove them from my daughter's lives. I've watched God work in the darkness that tried to take them. I've watched God work in the darkness that he's tried to, to, that's tried to move into marriages in our church. I'm telling you, some of you are sitting here and... It's a huge testimony to me of my answered prayer because you don't know that I prayed for you to get back in church and here you sit today in God's house. And it's not about me or my prayer life. It's about the God that I prayed to and faith believing he can do it. He can do it. I may not see him back tonight. I may not see him back this month. They may not come this Easter, but I promise you God's going. The God that hears my prayers is going to where there are and dealing with their hearts. Amen. I don't believe that. Amen. Say, preacher, I don't believe that. I don't believe that's how God's work. Amy's grandpa, that's the way he got saved. Had a family talking to him about coming to church. Her dad would come to the little poker shack behind his house in Hainstown after Sunday night service weep on his shoulders and he got to the place that he told the family don't ask me to go to church anymore don't ask me to come to church don't ask me to come to revival stop talking to me about it i do not want to hear it anymore the family left him alone and in silence on a sunday afternoon with half a slitch beer sitting at a picnic table beside his station wagon the holy ghost came and spoke to his heart his family was down at the church in hainstown singing his daughters were singing that afternoon in an afternoon gospel singing. And the Holy Ghost spoke to his heart according to his testimony and said, Thad, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Thad, you ought to be ashamed. Your kids are down there singing at God's house and you're so sorry you won't even get up and go to God's house and listen to them sing. I want to tell you something. God can speak a lot louder than you. And what he says, he knows exactly how to get your attention. Thad Gross left that slitch beer sitting there, got in his station wagon, drove down to Haynes Baptist Church. When he came through the door, they were singing a child's request. It's like a Hollywood movie, man. They were singing a child's request. You know what that song is about? It's about a little girl praying for her daddy to get saved. And who was it, Judy that was singing or Debbie? Judy was singing the verse of that song where the daddy came into the church and got saved just about the time Thad came in and sat down on the back row. And she couldn't keep singing. She just saw her daddy come in church and she's singing about him getting saved. And it wasn't long. They played through a chorus or two, no singing. And Thad got up, met her halfway down the aisle, got saved that day, got gloriously born again. God answers your prayers. Don't just curse the darkness. Talk about the light and what the light's done. Claim the light. I'm not preaching to name it and claim it. 
religion this morning, but I'm telling you, we've got some promises in those, in those pages that we can claim. It doesn't mean that God will do whatever you want, but it does mean that God will do whatever He wants. And if you'll pray, if you'll, if you'll, be, if you'll go on someone's behalf and intercede for them, I've seen God do it time and time and time and time again. There are marriages that are here because somebody prayed. There are, there are souls that have been saved because somebody prayed. There are homes that are together because somebody prayed. There's a building standing here because somebody prayed. There's a choir singing this morning because somebody prayed. There's a preacher standing here preaching the word of God to you because he had a mama and daddy and a grandmother that prayed for him. When he got in the darkness, there was a God that pulled him out because of their prayers. Hallelujah. I could preach there for a while. Claim the light. I'm not telling you to tell God what to do, but pray and say, God, I know you can do this. I know you can reach my daughter's heart. I know you can reach my son's heart. I know you can reach my wife's heart. I've said everything I know to say, Lord, but I know that you could reach their mind and their heart in your own special way, and I pray that you do it. I pray whether it's through something they see online or whether it's through a gospel message or whether it's through my prayer time, I pray that they, you get a hold of their heart as only you can. And I promise you this God that shakes the heavens and holds the earth in his hands, I promise you when he gets a hold of their heart and he convicts them, you won't need daddy telling them what to do. You won't need mama convicting their heart or putting guilt on them. There's a God that can put on them things you cannot and cause them to want to repent of their sin and come back to him don't just curse the darkness claim the light in verse 18 David goes on and he talks about God's awesome performance in his salvation God's awesome performance in his salvation now not as if God is an entertainer he is not made for our entertainment we are not made for his entertainment our world has become an entertainment-based society. That's all we are about is entertainment. Well, what would happen? And I know there have been some blips in Facebook and AT&T's coverage. What would happen if maybe for a month everything went dark? And you didn't have, a, you didn't have Instagram to look at or Facebook or television or streaming. Imagine how our homes would come together when you got nothing else to do except, except spend time together. When you got nothing else to do except to visit with people and talk to people face to face. Imagine how that would change a month, a year. They'd shut it all down, see if it changes the nation. Hallelujah. I know it's not going to happen, but a man can dream. Verse 18, he delivered me from my strong enemy. From them that hated me. For they were too strong for me. They prevented me in the day of my calamity. But the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth. Also unto a large place. <laughs> he delivered me. Because he delighted, he delighted in me. The Lord Rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanse, cleansing of my hands. Hath he recompensed me, for I have kept the ways of the Lord, and have not wickedly departed from my God. In verse 18, he had a strong enemy that was holding him. By the time he gets to verse 21, he's clothed in the righteousness of Christ. I know that he says, my righteousness but David is saying here that I cleansed my hands. I repented of my sins. And when I repented of my sins, the Lord cleansed me from my sins. And then he said, now I have been able to keep the ways of the Lord. I have not wickedly departed from my God. This is talking about his salvation of verse 18 and verses uh, 21 and 22. It is talking about how that he has walked with God after his salvation. He delivered me from a strong enemy. Them that hated me. Satan hates you. He does not love you. And when he had you in your sins, 
He wanted to hold you. Not because he loved you. He wanted to keep a death grip on your life. Because he wanted you to go to hell with him. He knows what his destiny is. And the Bible says here that when it came to the awesome performance of God, while the death grip was on my soul, while I was lost and undone without God or his son, there's a God that stepped into my situation and had performed a marvelous salvation for me. A cross that had been raised, a man that had died, God's son that shed his blood, a blood that had been sacrificed, a resurrection that had taken place. And then when he came to me and saved me, this God stepped into my life and became my deliverer. Awesome performance. As we just sung a moment ago, Jesus never fails. I have failed him, but he's never failed me. I cannot say one thing negative about God's performance in my life. I can say a lot of things negative about my performance as a Christian. But I want to tell you what I needed when I needed it. He showed up every time, and every time he gave me exactly what I needed. Before I was saved, he gave me his love and his mercy and his care. He came and took me out of the hands of a strong enemy that hated me, that was too strong for me, and rescued me from that enemy when I could not pull myself out, when I could not get out out of hell myself when my destiny was doomed there's a God that came and in his strength and in his power he removed me from that death sentence and placed me into the cleft of the rock and has covered me with his hand hallelujah don't just curse the darkness claim the light has he not done the same thing for you that's not the only time he's delivered me I'd like to say that the day I got saved, I started living for the Lord, and I never made a mistake. That's not true. I've got myself in the hog pen before. I've got myself in a mess before. But every time I've got myself in a mess, there's a God that showed up and performed just like he said he would. Every time I've got myself in a mess, he's got me out of the hog pen. He's brought me unto himself. He's cleaned me up. He's put me back in his wheel. He's forgiven me of the silly, stupid things that I've done. Stop just cursing the darkness, but tell somebody what God's done for you. I was saved at the age of five. At five, Paul, I didn't realize how strong the devil was. I didn't realize the power that he had. But as a teenager, I look back now at some of the things I did as a teenager, and how silly was that? How crazy was that for me to even try those things? How close could I have been from really messing up my entire life or going out of this world out of the will of God, dying in a condition I should not have been in? But there was a God that performed. There's a God that stepped in. That's right. There's a mama that was praying and a daddy that was praying. And I couldn't get too far. And that awesome God that can shake the heavens and the earth. Yeah. He just planned every one of his moves around my move. And he got me back into a place where I would serve him. Forgave me of my sins. Give my heart to him. Rededicate my life to him. I'm so glad that God, when it comes to his performance, has done everything that I've needed him to do. Sometimes it was chastisement, sometimes it was discipline, sometimes it was those arms of love, sometimes it was joy that I needed, sometimes it was mercy, but I'm telling you so far, he has been absolutely perfect in his performance. I needed him as a husband, and he's allowed me to remain married to the same woman now going on 32 years. I needed him as a father, and he's allowed me to raise two wonderful girls. They're not perfect, but two wonderful girls. He's allowed me to come into this place and pastor you. And y'all aren't always easy to pastor. (laughs) You don't know how many times I wanted to quit. You don't know how many times I wanted to go back to architecture. You don't know, I'm not poor mouthing, so you'll pity me. You don't know how many times I've come in and told him, that's it. I, I'm done. I, I, I can't do this. You know how many times that I have come home, and when, I, when Amy was sick and she wasn't able to come, I'd come in and I'd say, listen, 
if I get to heaven and God says, Zane, she asked me how I preach. I said, if I get to heaven and God said, Zane, I never really did call you to preach. Thanks for trying, though. Here's a, here's a participation trophy. I said, Amy, I preached so bad tonight that it would not surprise me at all if I've missed it completely. I've come home and said, that's it. Uh, you're sick. They need a pastor's wife. I think I should resign and, and let them get another pastor. I've come home uh, discouraged in me, discouraged in you, discouraged in things. I've come home and, and I've said, Amy, this is why you need to appreciate your pastor's wife. She's got to listen to me whine. And I'd come in and say, Amy, I think, I, I think it's just time for me to move. I, I don't think I'm effective there anymore. And this is what she'll say every time, every time. She knows exactly what to say. She'll say, well, if God told you to do that, you go right on and do that. The Lord will take care of us. And she knows God ain't told me to do it. She knows I'm frustrated in my flesh. She knows, uh, she knows I'm out of the way. She knows, listen to me, even in those times, God performs as he always has done. And on Monday mornings when I pick up my Bible, he picks up my heart. And when I begin to read his word and study, he begins to put me back where I need to be. Satan has beaten me down. People have beaten me down. Circumstances have beaten me down. But then he allows me to rise up above the darkness and see that the darkness is under his feet and as long as I'm with him the darkness is under my feet he has had an awesome performance in my life not that he's an entertainer but he does perform for us doesn't he has he not provided your needs has he not helped you with cars and houses and homes and bills has he not helped you to keep your family together and Keep your children in church. Has he not saved your children and grandchildren? Has God not been good? Don't just curse the darkness. Claim what the light's done. Number three, lastly, there's an amazing power that God has given me. He has amazing power, but then he gives me the ability to tap in to the power that he has. Verse number 29. For thou art my lamp, O Lord. What are we talking about? Darkness. Darkness. David said, in the darkness, you are a lamp. You are a help. Thou art my lamp, O Lord, and the Lord will lighten my darkness. For by thee have I run through a troop. By God I have leaped over the wall. And he's talking about times that he escaped Saul. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all them that trust him. For who is God? Save the Lord. And who is a rock? Save our God. For my God is strength and power. And he maketh his way perfect. He maketh my feet like hinds feet and setteth me upon the high places. He teacheth my hands to war so that at a, a, a so that a bow of steel is broken in my arms. Thou hast also given me a shield of my salvation. Thy gentleness hath made me great. Now, I'm not telling you that I'm great. I'm just telling you that I've had to have God's power sometimes. You're going to need his power. And I don't mean to shoot lightning bolts out of your fingers at your spouse. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about there are some times you're just going to have to walk in his power. You don't know how to handle a situation. You don't know how to talk about a situation. You don't know how to pray over a situation. So you've got to ask the Lord, give me some power here, Lord, help me. When I stand in this pulpit, I realize that I am just a man with a failing mind. The older I get, I've got a mind that's failing much, much more. To remember verses and things and preach, I just want you to know, I realize I can make mistakes and say the wrong things. But when I get in this pulpit, I pray that the Holy Spirit would empower me to preach the Word of God. And I want you to know, I know when He's on me. I know when the Holy Spirit is using me. I can feel His power. I'm not saying that I'm better than somebody else or I'm a greater preacher than anybody else. I'm just saying, I'm just thinking that he's allowed me to witness his amazing power in my life. And it's not just the power that he gives me, but it's the power. Some of you have gotten saved since I've been here. You've gotten saved and in the will of God. And for years you thought you couldn't live it. 
You thought you couldn't get away from those friends. You thought you couldn't get away from the alcohol and the poker and the gambling or the drugs. You thought you couldn't get away from those things. But here you sit, away from those things. Your children are saved. You're in God's house. God's power has been reflected in your life. It's not, it's not your power. It's God's power. But thank God he's allowed me to get in on that power. And sometimes when I pray, I need his power in my prayer life because I'm praying for some things that I cannot say. And I want him to do some things that I cannot do. And I want him to go some places that I cannot go. But I'm telling you, when the, when the prayer answers come back, I realize it's the power of God that did all that. It's that buckler that I'm depending on. You know what a buckler is? It's a big rock wall that you can get behind when the enemy is firing its darts at you. And sometimes you feel like you can't escape those darts. The Bible says you can get down behind God and his power and say, Lord, I can't overcome them. I cannot do what you're asking me to do. But if you'll give me the power, I'll hide behind you the whole way. I didn't ever think I could preach. I still don't think I can preach. I didn't think I could ever preach, Jerry. When God called me to preach, I told him, I said, now I know you've never made a mistake. And I know you're always right. But Lord, I think you're wrong this time. And I won't tell anybody. I'll keep it a secret. So I surrendered the call to preach, and I thought I was just going to preach on Wednesday nights when Teague was out, and I was happy with that. In fact, I told Teague, I said, if you never call me to preach, I just want the Lord to know I'm surrendered. I'm surrendered. I'll do whatever he wants me to do. I certainly didn't want to go full-time into the ministry. You see the sense of humor God has, don't you? And Dwayne, I did not want a pastor. I did not want a pastor. I did not. But you know, there's a God that has enough power. He can take the desires of your heart and he can change the desires of your heart and I'm standing here telling you I know that what I'm doing right now may not be the best at it but I know that what I'm doing right now is the perfect will of God for my life no I know that's why Amy says every time I want to resign and write my letter of resignation and hand it in to her she says now if God told you to do this let's do it she knows God hadn't told me to do it but David said in these verses there's something about this light that has overcome the darkness that we see. And I would like to say that an election in November is going to change this darkness, but it's not. It's upon us, and it's going to take a church revival is what it's going to take. It's going to take a Holy Ghost revival, and our churches, the church is part of this problem, and the churches that are accepting some of these things into their midst, they ought to, be, they ought to take church off of their name. They're not of God. They're not a church. And what I'm saying is, I believe that this all-powerful, earth-shaking, heaven-holding, cherub-riding God can bring revival to this place. But that's what it's going to take. I wish an election would turn it around. If it would, I'd go fill out all the ballots I could and shove them in the boxes like I did last time. That's cheating and I can't cheat. That's the sin. If I thought it would, I'd put all my hope in an election. My hope's not in an election. My hope's in that Jesus that can never fail. What was, last, what was the last choir song, Paul? What was the last choir song? The great I am still is. He's still great. He's still powerful. He's still holy. Stop cursing the darkness and not mentioning the light, but claim the light as much as you curse the darkness. I tell you, this world needs to hear there is hope in Jesus Christ. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes?